Hi, I'm Marcel. I'm a, uh, a mathematician at La Trobe University. My big fat idea today is actually about uh, uh, rhythm, in fact. So it's going to be a maths talk, but don't worry, this is the only equation and it's not really actually maths, but it makes a little bit of an observation. Now, to me, music does seem to have some kind of mathematical feel to it. I mean, it's hard to really put your finger on it, um, but you can think that music consists of a, a rhythm and this pitch changes and pitch over the top of that rhythm. Now actually there's been a lot written about the role of uh, mathematics in analysing harmony and what, what makes um, two notes together sound right, but much less has been um, written when it comes to, to, to rhythm. And to me, rhythm really felt a lot more like the kind of thing I do in mathematics. So in mathematics we'd spend a lot of time uh, looking at funny patterns and symmetries of patterns. And uh, this might sound like it's just a bit of a game, but um, while it is fun, actually we all benefit from this mathematics because it underlies all of the technological advancements that we experience from smartphones to the technology you're using right now to watch me. Because at the lowest level at least, all information is transmitted between computing devices in terms of ons and offs, and all information has to be coded. So I've chosen here uh, um, a, one of the Voyager spacecraft um, because of course, that transmits information from a very large distance. It's the furthest uh, mathematical man-made object in, that we have, um, just leaving the solar system. And the information there is sent using some code of zeros and ones, a famous mathematical object actually called the Golay code. Um, it holds amazing symmetry properties. And it was chosen specifically because it has to transmit information across a really narrow bandwidth. So the study of these funny patterns and their symmetries actually underlies all the kinds of tricks that computer scientists and mathematicians have had to come up with to transmit information. And to me, these feel like the kind of maths that should be involved in studying rhythm. And I was sort of interested to know, you know what, what, what really is out there? I mean, we know that music has a creative side to it and that we're not trying to turn that into mathematics, but it does sit on top of a whole bunch of rules, whether it be time signature or, or harmony. So here is a, um, a famous rhythm. It's called the, uh, the paradiddle. Um, it's used by percussionists to break the left and right arm kind of a, uh, a bias. So a right-handed person would tend to have a right-hand bias. So there's really two places we could naturally start. I've got a kind of a left one, so, and then a right one. And you can see this is the kind of thing to me that looks mathematical. I mean, there's a weird symmetry. If you take the first one and read it backwards, you get the second one. Alternatively, if you start with the first one and just change the left to right, you get the second one. It's a sort of a weird sim anti-symmetry, symmetry kind of property. It feels mathematical. Let, let's have a bit of a play with it, because when I um, first saw this, one of the first things that came to mind, if we've got a left and a right one, surely we could arrange these according to the rhythm itself. So for example, we could take a, uh, what well, starts with a left, and then it follow, it's followed by a right. So we could have a whole copy of the left paradiddle followed by the right one. So here I have, in fact, a paradiddle of paradiddles so you can see the first um, beat was a left, so I put a whole left paradiddle, then a whole right one, then another whole right one, then a whole left one. And you can actually tap this out, okay? So, anyway, yeah, it takes a bit of practice. So um, once we've got this though, you could of course just keep on doing this. So a paradiddle of paradiddle of paradiddles. And in fact, here I've just put together a bit of a, um, the start of this. You can go on forever and you get some strange infinite pattern. And this is just playing. But actually, this is one of the most famous infinite mathematical words, we'd call it, a kind of a sequence. It's called the Prouet Tui Morse sequence. And it's famous precisely because it arises so often in various different kinds of mathematics. And the reason it arises are actually sort of of interest from a rhythmic perspective too. So let's actually have a little bit of a play of it. The first thing is, is it's a strange sort of fractal word. Now, I'm not going to go into fractals too much, but I think people have a vague idea. This is a particularly tasty looking fractal, but you can imagine if you zoom in on one of those little peaks, it's going to look pretty much like the entire cauliflower to start off with. And the little peaks themselves have little peaks on them, and if you zoom in on them, then it will look like the entire cauliflower again. Now, of course, with an actual vegetable, this breaks down, but in a kind of a mathematical fractal, you can go on forever. Now, for this infinite sequence, and I've got a bit of it here, you can't zoom in uh, any further, but you can zoom out. 
And let's actually see what happens, because to me this seems quite a natural thing to think of math uh, musically, because in music we often like to give some kind of emphasis to maybe every fourth beat, or maybe the first beat in every block of four, or maybe every second beat. So let's actually do that here, so put a bit of a kind of a two, four time on it. Okay, so I'll fade away all of the odd beats, or the even ones actually. So here I've just got the, the first, third, fifth, seventh, and so on. And lo and behold, it's exactly the same sequence. Um, and of course, once that's true, we know that if I was to fade away every second one of the currently black uh, beats, I'd get another copy, so, which of course is every fourth beat. And you can keep on going like this forever. So here is every eighth one, which could, should come as no surprise because that's how we originally generated the sequence. So this is an example of this kind of crazy fractal nature of this word. Now there are a number of other things that make this interesting mathematically and musically. So one is, is that it doesn't actually ever repeat. Uh, I'll make that precise in a moment, but let's first see how the sense in which it does almost repeat. It almost repeats in the sense that if you take any pattern that you can hear, and I've picked out here fairly arbitrarily, right, left, left, right, right. So it's just a completely random pattern. I just chose the first thing that came to mind. Then it does reoccur. So you can see I've gone through this um, first, I don't know, 64 or 128 beats here, and I've just marked out all of the copies of that pattern. And you can see it does appear again and again and again, which is the kind of thing you might want from a rhythm but they're sort of spread out in a strange, irregular pattern. You never have to wait too long. Maybe you have to wait maybe 12 beats or something before you hear it again. But even in the infinite version of this word, it continues to reoccur infinitely often. And this is precisely the kind of property that it was important mathematically that gives rise to this. Would you ever actually get this pattern twice in a row? Well, perhaps this one not, but some patterns occur twice in a row. For example, we have left followed by left. And I can see a left right followed by a left right. But what you can never get is three uh, versions of the same pattern all in a row. And this is a, one of the um, most important uh, properties mathematically. Um, so uh, strangely enough, this sequence occurs because of these reasons in, in algebra, in number theory, differential equations, dynamical systems, and chess. So one of the discoverers, not Prue or Tui or Morse, but um, was actually a, one of the top chess players in the 1920s, so Max Uwe, who was in fact the world champion in 1935 to 37, and he independently discovered this sequence because one of the rules of chess at the time was that you were never allowed to play a sequence of moves and then play the same sequence of moves and then start a third time. And he discovered independently this sequence and published it to prove that this rule of chess was insufficient to stop a chess game going forever. So it was possible to have an infinite game of chess. But this isn't Max over here. This is just a very slow looking game of chess. <laughs> and, um, this is uh, strangely enough, I mean, a game here um, turns out to have the same, give the rise to the same property that makes it important mathematically. So changing tack a little bit, one of the most interesting pieces of mathematics attached to, to rhythm has been the study of, of equal spacing of beats. So say we had 16 beats overall and we wanted to distribute five of them to be, say, maybe the, where the drum hits. And we have to stick to these um, 16. Now, five doesn't go into 16. Uh, and so we're going to have to space them slightly irregularly. And musicologists became very interested in this when they studied world rhythms because world rhythms from Africa and various places across the world, in fact, um, tend to be very complicated compared to classical music. And they wanted to know what were the common themes to this? Because one of the common themes that seemed to be emerging was that they involved quite equal spacing of beats. So let's um, look completely uh, what looks to be a totally different kind of um, picture. So let's pretend I am a computer for a little moment and I have to draw a straight line. Now, we know when we look at a computer on a screen, it's pixelated. There are no real straight lines on a computer. It has, it's all kind of chunky. So if, if this is my computer here and I have to approximate this um, straight line by using the grid, then a natural way to do this is just to walk along the grid, keeping as close as possible to the line as I can. So I've done that here. Uh, so here I am. I've started at the start and I've tried to stay above the line, but whenever I'm getting too far away, I, I, I turn right. So this is me trying to stay as close as possible to the line. And it's roughly speaking what, what happens when we draw a straight line on a computer screen. And you can see that because five didn't go into 16, the steps, well, they're sort of roughly the same length. They're roughly five sixteenth, I guess, uh, something like that. But but they're going to have to have some irregularities. 
And strangely enough, this is, in fact, a very famous rhythm. This is really the bossa nova clave rhythm. So clave sticks, this kind of thing. So here we'd probably go like, well, normally in the bossa nova, we'd start not at the very bottom of this, but halfway up the staircase, but it makes a rhythm like, And the slightly longer one is this batch of four at the top here. So normally we'd start here. So this is an example of uh, the kind of mathematics that's been involved in the study of rhythms. And it's an example of a world rhythm. Here is the same rhythm on the right, uh, drawn as a kind of a necklace. So I've got blue beads where the beat is supposed to be. the 16 beads in total, and I've distributed five of them. Now, I've got two rhythms here. The one on the left is... Uh, slave clave rhythm and that also is quite evenly spaced but you can see it doesn't look quite as evenly spaced it's got a little group of two and it's two groups of four and there's a couple of three um, intuitively the one on the right the bossa nova one is the one that's the most equally spaced and one of the interesting piece of mathematics involved here was um, the first the a real understanding of what it meant to be maximizing equal spacing it turns out for example that if you're looking for five beats in 16, then there is a unique arrangement that maximizes the sum of those pink lines, the length of those pink lines. So the sum of the length of the pink lines on the, the left is less than the one on the right. And so using this idea, it was, this was shown to be true always for different numbers. Um, strangely enough, the same situation arises in neutron accelerators. Uh, and it totally doesn't sound like rhythm, but in fact, they have voltage oscillations, maybe 800 in a given second and they have to send down information like bursts of energy into this neutron accelerator and they have to do it at the peak of a voltage and it's important to keep them as evenly apart as possible so it's fine if you're sending down a hundred bursts of energy in a, a second a hundred divides 800 you just have to send it down every eighth pulse if you like but what if you want to send down 103 bursts of energy out of 800 you can't do that evenly and so they were physicists at the Los Alamos um, Neutron accelerator, for example, were interested in trying to find this even spacing and they arrived at sort of a, an algorithm for doing this that turns out to agree with the maximal spacing by looking at the uh, sum of these distances. Strangely enough, the same thing can be thought of in terms of uh, a pitch. So I know I said we were going to talk about rhythm, but there's seven different notes in a typical, say, a major scale um, and there's 12 semitones in total in, in an octave. So what if you were just to be a bit crazy, decide to try and distribute seven amongst 12 as evenly as possible? Well, strangely enough, the white keys on the keyboard are exactly an example of this. So that is the most even way to distribute seven uh, beats, if you like, out of 12. Um, and you can see the strange asymmetry that the musical keyboard had, which to me looks so mathematical. I mean, it repeats by octave, but it's got this weird asymmetry. That sort of is an instance of exactly this. Of course, the black notes, the pentatonic scale, that's the same kind of thing. That's distributing five notes as equally as possible amongst 12. And armed with this kind of perspective, you could try things like, let's try and distribute eight notes as evenly as possible amongst 12. And there you get this strange scale, the octatonic scale, which is sometimes encountered in jazz, for example. So you can kind of play around and make up new things. So to finish up with, I mentioned before that it was musicologists that became interested in this equal spacing. And the reason was, was that they had world rhythms all around the world, strange exotic rhythms by classical music standards. And they noticed that often they were very similar or the same. So this is a very strange rhythm. So this is. So it's got a little uh, asymmetry. It's got a block of three followed by four blocks of, blocks of two, then a block of three followed by five blocks of two has to be considered a pretty weird rhythm. Um, and yet, it's been recorded both in Bulgarian music and in Central African music, in traditional music. Now, how could such a strange rhythm appear in these two different places? Well, in fact, this was what led the musicologists to become interested in the mathematics of equal spacing, because this does turn out to be the most equal spacing of 11 beats in 24. Now, why 11 and 24? Well, lots of exotic rhythms occur in those kind of places of the world. but. Um, once it starts to become natural to, to have equal spacing, that gives an explanation as to why this would occur in two totally different places. And that's what I had to say. Thank you.